Hi, my name's Stuart, and I want to talk about developer productivity today. A lot of this is my opinion uh, based on supervising projects for most of my working lifetime and seeing the patterns and anti-patterns that make developers more or less productive. So let's dig right in. Here's an odd one that most people don't think of. And that's this. There's a whole bunch of studies done by some very big universities. And what they discovered was, in terms of developer productivity, typing speed matters. And the idea is, is that above a certain rate of words a minute, typed accurately, so you're not always having to stop and correct or worse, reach for the mouse, that the rate at which your brain as a developer or engineer forms ideas and the rate at which you can can execute those ideas in the form of code uh, is roughly equal. And touch typing means that it's now an innate skill and you're not consciously thinking about typing, it's just happening. And that means that the thinking parts of your brain are able to focus on the problem you're trying to solve. Parenthetically, over the years, I've given a lot of developers a copy of Mavis Beacon Teaches Typing. Um, and the results are universally, in my experience, good. 20 minutes of drill a day for a month results in phenomenally better typing performance and that means that developers are no longer bandwidth limited by their ability to key in what they want to think about. Ergonomics. There's a lot of talk about ergonomics. It's probably one of the hotly contested things. High-end tech companies spend a lot of money on ergonomics and a lot of very cheap companies spend a lot too little on economics. Uh, on So the takeaway from a bunch of different studies of general worker productivity, much less developer productivity, shows that at some point the ergonomics of their work area are good enough to not be an impediment. In other words, um, some of the deluxe castle in the sky ergonomic things that are popular with very high-end dev shops uh, are actually perks, rewards, but they don't materially improve performance. They might materially improve attitude. But bigger factors for developers, or indeed anyone who's a cognitive worker, is noise, light, and privacy. And these are particularly difficult challenges for the developer community who tend to be introverts. And so off open office plans can really make the developers very self-conscious and um, they, they suffer. They tend to, you tend to have lower retention um, and they're going to be less productive and they're certainly going to be less happy. So think about providing good environments for developers. Tooling. I have had a number of truly stupid conversations with Fortune 1000 companies or, or, or even richer companies that should know better that say, well, we're not going to give this set of developers the tool they need to be productive uh, because it costs more than our delegation authority or it would be too hard. We don't want to manage the license or we've already adopted a completely different tool and that's the shop standard or we've decided to be best of breed or all these excuses that are just nuts. So the right tools with a degree of mastery lead to Im improved productivity, but the lack of good tools 
and or tool mastery absolutely subtracts hard from productivity. So here's a little thought problem, right? If we look at average developer uh, salaries and we look at the loaded cost, and let's say that our tool stack for this developer costs $1,000. So above and beyond uh, their workstation or whatever, they need $1,000 in specialized tools. And before they had the tool, they were adding um, value to the company at the rate of $127,000 a year. Um, and after the tool, they're adding almost $200,000 worth of value per year. And so how many hours of their salary did it take to pay back that $1,000 investment? Well, the answer is roughly 30. So do the math, right? All you need to do to justify the spend of something is to follow the fundamental rule of don't ask what it costs, ask what it will make and subtract one from the other. And if you get a positive number, then you should spend the money. It's a no brainer. The same applies to stacks and training. Um, the biggest training mistake I see organizations make is they say, well, we're gonna move to this new platform in six or eight months, and we're just gonna train everybody up right now. So we're gonna send them to week-long classroom training. And six months from now, A, the platform's probably changed materially, and B, the chances that since they haven't used it in the intervening time are basically zero, uh, that was a terrible investment. There is no substitute for just-in-time training, and the best just-in-time training is to pair up a developer who knows the platform but may not know the business domain with a developer that knows the business domain but doesn't know the platform. Because as they work through problems in order to add or create business value, one developer is going to acquire domain expertise and the other developer will acquire platform expertise. It's a win-win. And again, there's some diminishing productivity uh, involved in pair programming, but if you're trying to teach a new skill to someone, the best thing to do is to have them partner up with someone who is that skills master. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. All of the arguments I've ever seen around Java versus .NET versus whatever, or this editor versus that editor, or this database versus that database, are all fundamentally religious ones. It turns out that if you have the right tools and you have the right platform mastery and you're trying to solve general purpose business problems, right? The 80% use case that the more tools you have in your toolbox, the better choices you'll be able to make in order to solve that business problem. So things like shop standards are fine until they essentially drive out independent thought and common sense. You know, our primary tool is Java. Great. That's the 80% use case. But if you have something that falls in the 20% use case, making the 80% use case tool work for the 20% use case is probably going to cost you 80% more than you expect. So pick the right tool for the job. And Standards are great and conformance is great, but you want to measure the desired outcomes, which is the, and the desired outcome is the delivery of business value while managing risk to an acceptable level. And that is the only measurement that anybody should ever consider. Critical thinking. It just turns out that there are very few jobs that don't require some level of critical thinking. 
even jobs that you might not think need critical thinking need critical thinking and developers and QA and all the other associated software lifecycle roles need critical thinking as their primary skill. And so if you have people that have the innate ability to think critically, you can train them to be better critical thinkers, building on their innate ability and temperament. But for the majority of individuals for whom critical thinking is a bar they can never reach, it's probably not useful to have them in a role which requires the deep introspection that typically being a developer or a QA or a BA or a PM requires. And the, the ones that tend to be bad at their job, when we drill down and see if it's a training issue or a mentoring issue or whatever issue, the bottom of that well is a suitability. And that suitability revolves around the ability to do critical thinking. If it sucks to work where you work, you probably have an HR problem. And I live and work in California, and we take uh, hostile work environments very seriously. But honestly, if everyone would just remember the rule that they learned in kindergarten, then workplaces would be a lot less like work and a lot more like an avocation, something you want to do. So. Having a good work environment doesn't necessarily make people more productive, in my experience. But having a bad work environment definitely kills the productivity of a team. The process by which you develop and ship software matters. Here is the perfect curve, and I've spoken about this in lots of other videos. But essentially, branch develop, pull request, peer review, build, store the build artifacts once and deploy it many, many times for many different users to have different tests on is the right way to do things. And I have a whole video on this. But if your shop isn't doing this, you're missing out on an opportunity to have better shipping tempo, better productivity, and better quality. And the better those things are, the lower your risk is, and the more business value your teams will produce. There are still teams out in the world using some other source control tool that isn't Git. None of those things have come even close to how clever useful and stable Git is. Every serious software shop you have any respect for has adopted Git. Microsoft uses Git. In the olden days of not many years ago, we focused on client server architectures. But in fact, client server architectures have some innate scaling problems. They work great for tactical or office level, small organization level problems, but the majority of the big boy problems that we have to deal with as developers for these big organizations, for these, you know, large enterprises are distributed computing problems. And the 12 factor manifesto which everyone should read and heed, addresses the concerns that you have to think about when you're trying to make an, a distributed architecture to solve some big problem. Lots of data, lots of transactions, lots of users, lots of anything. 12 factor is the guidance that will make you more productive by avoiding the anti-patterns 
that cause developers to live in production production support hell instead of creating new business value. Epic fail. One of the 12 factor rules, rule 10, says there should be the parity between the non-production environments and the production environment. In other words, non-production environments should vary in numeracy, that is the number of servers, instances, databases, size of things, whatever, but it shouldn't vary in character, right? If my development database is using technology A, but my production database is using technology B, I've pretty much failed because what you're doing when you either A, fail to provide like-for-like -like environments, or B, fail to provide environments at all, is you're handcuffing the developers, and you're guaranteeing that most of the serious testing is going to happen in production, the exact last place you want it to happen. There's a, a movement called the DevOps movement. Gene Kim has written a lot about this. A lot of really super smart people have written about this. There have been great contributions by Netflix and Twitter and Microsoft and Pivotal. And there's just a ton of really good writing about this. You know what's not different between all those things is the fundamental in underpinning of the theory of DevOps. That this figure eight pattern of continuous and never-ending improvement anchored by continuous integration and continuous deployment is absolutely table stakes for building distributed systems and for being able to have productive developers, QA, BAs, PMs, operators, and happy business people because they have revenue and happy customers. DevOps isn't even a discussion anymore. If you don't have a successful, well-crafted, butter smooth DevOps program that involves all of the stakeholders and their appropriate roles, you are simply going to be out-competed by organizations that do. Part of the drive for continuous integration is that we don't ever want to build or deploy software on some developer's machine. We want code to go into source control and get pulled onto a reference build pipeline that always executes the same way into a repository. And then from that repository, we deploy it to whatever environment we want to deploy it to. So that we never, ever, ever have to deal with this hateful idiom ever again. The other thing that hugely contributes to programmer productivity is good personal habits. So let's drill into this because overwhelmingly, this is the number one thing. It's not a tool, although I'm using Git heavily here because, well, you should, but it's about habits, about good habits that all successful developers have, right? You start by picking a story. You read the story. Is the story ready? No, we're not working on that story. Is the story small enough to do in a reasonable amount of time? And what constitutes reasonable amount of time varies from team to team. But I'm here to tell you, if it's longer than three days, it's probably needs to be split into smaller stories. Make sure that before you start coding as a developer, you have the latest code, right? So if you're, if your main development line is the develop branch, you want to go into the develop branch, do a git pull and make sure that you're starting from the current baseline. Make a feature branch, switch to it, and then do a cycle that goes, code a little, write some tests, code a little, write some tests, code a little, write some tests. And that whole cycle in the purple boxes, right, should be 15 minutes to half an hour at the outside. 
And when you get to a recitative, right, a place where you've kind of coded up to a certain place and the tests pass and it does something useful, then you should do a commit and a push. And you'll notice there's an angel wing attached to them, and I'll explain why in a minute. And you keep doing that until you think you have enough for someone to review. And then you make a pull request. And people review your pull request. And if your pull request is shiny, your code gets folded into the active branch. And then you go back and you pick another story. And you repeat. And if people have comments about your code or suggestions about your code or just plain old reject your code, then you go back to coding a little, writing tests, et cetera, et cetera. And you keep doing that until either A, they fire you for incompetence or B, they look upon your code with love and continence and it joins the great river of code of goodness. So, in a day, you may or may not have finished an entire story. In a week, you may have done one story, two stories, three stories, ten stories, right? Some of the stories are bugs. Some teams treat bugs as stories. I like that. But you will have repeated the light blue purple box cycle over and over again. And you'll do it over and over and over and you're done with a story when your pull request is accepted. And then you can go and start the next one. And you want things that are small enough that your pull request will be shiny. Let me point out that successful teams often figure out a way that for a story, the, the first approach might be that there's only one pull request, the one at the end, the ultimate. But it turns out that if you're good at refactoring or you're good at adding features in such a way that don't break the world, or you're fixing a bug, or a set of related bugs, or you're doing a set of related refactorings and you can do them incrementally, that you're far better off doing your story as a series of pull requests. Before we get there though, the reason that we want to commit as we're working in Git is because that basically functions as a place you can undo to. And the reason we want to push that commit to your feature branch in the sky, the origin, is in case something awful happens. What we call a negative bus interaction. You got hit by a bus. Before you leave your desk, commit and push. Whether it's going for a bio break, going to lunch, going home, going to a meeting, if you are leaving your desk, do a commit and a push. Remember, committing and pushing doesn't put your code into the main development line. There's 0% chance you'll mess somebody else up, right? Because you're not working in the main development line, you're working in your feature branch. You're creating intellectual property on behalf of your employer. You owe it to them and your team, fellow team members to make sure that that code is safely ensorcelled in the sky. Okay, back to peer reviews. So for a story, why have multiple pull requests, you ask? Here's why. It's way faster to review a series of small pull requests that move the ball towards the goal of finishing the story and you're much more likely to get three good things. Number one is, if you're starting down a path that may not be optimal for the problem you're solving, before you get too much invested of that, and you know, by invested I mean you're spending your employer's money, you'll get a chance to get peer feedback. Here's my approach. Here's my class structure. I haven't implemented some of these methods yet, but this is how I'm going to lay it out. And 
where we're going to be respectful of their time because now they're looking at seven files, 300 lines of code at most, and are able to very, very quickly look at your code and say, yes, you're going in the right direction. And yes, you seem to have some, some tests that are intelligent. Don't test stupid stuff. And you're taking a risk-based approach to your testing, which is a different video. Instead of having these massive pull requests with hundreds of changes, which I'll be honest, no one on your team is going to have patience for, which means either your stuff's going to get dumped into the, into the main branch, um, or it's going to chew up a lot of CPU time as the CI build kicks off if you're using the gated build pro uh, process, which some teams do. But either way, you have forfeited the opportunity to get early feedback and keep getting incremental feedback by asking for five minutes, 10 minutes at a time from your peers who may have really great ideas and they'll be more willing to treat the peer review process seriously because you're being respectful of their time and the quality will go up and your productivity will go up because you're reducing the scope of rework because multiple pull requests for the same story, break the story into smaller chunks. And so you're going to have productivity because if you start down a path that maybe is a little less optimal, your peers will be able to spot it and help you out. And programming is no longer a solitary sport. It's a team sport. And we like a rising tide lifts all boats, peer reviews and pull requests are the mechanism by which everybody gets better. Reading someone else's code may give you ideas for solving the problems you've been assigned. And giving constructive, respectful, productive feedback to others lifts their skills, builds camaraderie. And if you don't believe me, go ask anyone who's ever served in the armed forces. Story quality couldn't be more important as a driver of programmer productivity. If you think about that flow that we looked at earlier, right? First thing on the checklist after reading the story was, is this story codable and testable? Are there acceptance criteria? Is there, um, you know, depending on the style of story that your team writes, do you have the data it requires to understand what the user's goal is at the end of this story? And the acceptance criteria to be able to write tests to validate that the thing that you wrote meets the criteria. Badly written stories are a drag on everyone. And a culture of poorly written stories results in bad outcomes, not building the thing the business actually needs, not ever finishing anything, not having good quality, having things go over time, over budget, which is generally the same thing, right? So if we're going to have programmer productivity, in fact, if we're going to have team productivity, then the input to that is good stories. Garbage in, garbage out. So if you have a really good set of people in the BA role, whatever their title is, but people who know how to craft a story so that devs and QAs can read it and know what should happen, those people are precious and should be retreated with deference and respect because they are supplying the fuel to you, the engine, to produce business value. So here's some key metrics. And I want to say a few words about metrics. So Drucker said, you cannot manage what you do not measure. And Deming replied, 
that if there is no metric for something, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be successful. So what I say to people is have some metrics, don't obsess about them, but keep an eye on them and pay attention to non-metricized things. What is the esprit de corps of the team? What is the functionality of the team? Are they a cohesive unit? Are, do they have a sense of purpose? Are they imbued with a purpose from the business that shows them how they are contributing to business value to make the company they work for better? Do you have a good culture in your team? Do you have a good culture in your shop? Those are the non-observables, the dem or sorry, the non-metrics that Deming was talking about, things that are really hard to measure. And Drucker's point was, there are things you can measure, and if you can measure it, you should measure it, and if you measure it, you should probably manage using those measurements. They're both right. But they were making different points about different things. Story rejections. So there's scores, right? Story rejections times the number of story points per BA. BAs with really high scores, you need to have a conversation about. Pull request rejections per developer. This is a tricky one because they're always, if they're doing it right and they're doing a series of incremental pull requests, there may be some rejections in there. So you shouldn't obsess about that. But if their metric is significantly different than the rest of the teams, especially if it's worse, then maybe there's a mentoring, training, whatever opportunity there. And maybe there's an opportunity to introduce that individual to the environmental economic opportunity pool. Um, bug points, right? We take the count times the severity. You can use a sliding scale. You can use um, a Fibonacci sequence, doesn't matter as long as you rate bug points the same way for, every, for all roles. People with really high bug counts or bug point counts, right, are not being diligent enough in writing their tests or they're being deliberately obtuse about interpreting the story or whatever, but there's something wrong. Ditto people whose code doesn't play well with others, build failures. Now, everybody's going to have a, uh, is going to break the build occasionally. Sometimes you and somebody else will merge some codes and while they merge together, it turns out they just don't want to cohabitate. And it's okay as long as you then get together and go, okay, what should we have done? And you fix it right now, right? Build failures are the number one thing you should fix in your shop. You want to measure velocity and you want to compare their velocity to their rejections and bug points. So you have developers with incredibly high velocity, but their bug points and rejections are really high too. And they break the build a lot. You need to talk to those people. I will take consistency over velocity every time. Give me a developer that can grind out 10 story points a week with a very low bug point count and a reasonable rejection count over the, the uh, developer who's a hamster on a wheel and is just coating themselves up a, 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 a nest of bugs. Keep an eye on how good your QAs are, right? QAs that find lots of bugs are our gems because they're thoughtful about testing lazy qas don't file bugs and just because it's a bug doesn't mean a it's going to get fixed because that's a business decision and b that somebody did something wrong it just means that the developer and the qa may have read the story differently and what they need to do is go back to the ba or the proxy for the program and say 
we had different thoughts when we read this story. Which one did you intend? Here's the pros and cons, right? Have the conversation, be a human.